Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. So, when was holography invented? What year about? Well, it was originally invented by Gabor back in 1948, a long time ago. But at that time, we didn't have a laser, and so it was pretty limited um, what he could really do with holography. And then it was kind of reborn again in the early 60s, 63, 64 time frame, by uh, Leith and Upotniks at the University of Michigan. And um, they started to work on it because of some of the side-looking radar work they had been doing in the classified area led them to holography. And about the same time, the laser came along. And so uh, I think it was 1964 that they uh, showed off some of their first holograms made using holography. And uh, Actually, I saw my first hologram in 1964, and that's why I'm in optics instead of something like solid state uh, solid state uh, physics, because I really, I, I was really impressed with uh, a hologram. Well, one one of the largest applications of holography was holographic optical testing, or maybe I should say, is holographic optical testing, where you um, well, you can measure a lot of things, but in particular, you can measure how a surface shape changes, and it can be almost any surface. It could be a, a, a diffuse surface. So not only, you're not measuring the shape of the surface necessarily, but you're measuring how the surface shape changes when you apply a, a temperature variation across it or a mechanical load or something on it. So what, what we're going to talk about today is sort of holographic interferometry, but we're not going to think of it uh, as holograms. We're going to think of it as phase-shifting interferometry. So it's going to be phase-shifting non-destructive testing, and then we'll go on to uh, uh, what will be phase-shifting uh, two-wavelength interferometry. But they're really holographic techniques that we kind of have made more modern by using solid state detector arrays and phase shifting techniques. So there's a lot of applications where you want to see the difference between two measurements, like deformations is one example, uh, two wavelength holography interferometry, which we haven't talked about yet, will be a second example. But in any case, we want to find the difference between the two measurements. And you know, um, so I could have, I could be looking at um, uh, your desk, and we could, uh, and you, you put your notebook on the desk, and that puts a little load on it, and so that desk deforms a little bit. And so we could use this particular technique for measuring how that desk deforms. Now, uh, you could do it by measuring the phase distribution of the light reflected from the desk and measure how the phase distribution changes when you put your notebook on the desk. Or we can go through and just not calculate the initial phase distribution, but we're just going to work with intensities. And I'll show you in a second just what, what I mean here. So instead of just subtracting the two measurements or calculate the phases for the two measurements and then subtract the phases, we can work directly with the intensities that we measure. So we're going to use phase shifting, uh, and I'll, for the illustration here, we're going to use four steps. And so initially, the light reflected off of the desk or whatever it is we're measuring. We'll have some phase dis distribution I'm going to write as phi 1, phi 1 function of position. And in the case of a diffuse surface, I mean, this is really pretty much a, uh, a random phase distribution. And we'll then, so we have some irradiance here we'll call I11. We'll then do our normal phase shifting of 90 degrees, and so that plus cosine becomes a minus sine, and we're going to call that I12. Another 90 degrees, the minus sine becomes a minus cosine. So we'll call that I13. 
and another 90 degrees uh, minus cosine becomes a plus sine, and we'll call that I14. Uh, so we're going to measure these gradients distributions at some number of points, maybe, maybe a million points each. Then we're going to deform the surface, and we're going to, or, or change the surface in some way, and we're going to repeat these four measurements. And now instead of the phase being phi 1, we're going to write it as phi 2. And again, phi 2 is a function of position. Now what I really, what we want to determine is phi 2 minus phi 1. And so we could go through our arctangent calculation and determine phi 2 and phi 1. But what we're going to do is just work with these intensities here. So we make note that the sine of phi 2 minus phi 1 from a trig identity is minus a cosine of phi 2, sine of phi 1, plus cosine phi 1, sine phi 2. And a somewhat similar expression here for the cosine of the difference phi 2 minus phi 1, cosine phi 1, cosine phi 2, plus sine phi 1, sine phi 2. And so we could write here that the arctangent uh, phi difference, so phi 2 minus phi 1 is just the, the sine portion here, or the arctangent of the sine over the cosine. OK, so now I want to relate this back to the, to the I, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, and so on. And so I note here that I, 1, 1 minus I, 1, 3 is 2B cosine phi 1. And I14 minus I12 is 2B sine phi 1, and so on, that we can, can solve here for the, the sines and the cosines of phi 1 and phi 2. And so I could just take that and plug that back into this equation here and um, uh, go through the algebra here, which all of you, I'm sure, will go back to your office today and go through this to make sure I didn't make a mistake. And we end up then that phi difference, uh, phi 2 minus phi 1, is given by the arctangent of just these irradiances. I2, 3 minus I2, 1 times I1, 4 minus I1, 2, and, and so on here. And so we can determine phi 2 minus phi 1 uh, simply by a little bit of algebra with these eight irradiance measurements. Okay. So that leads us to what we're going to call, um, well, it has a lot of different names. I'm, here I'm calling dynamic thing, the electronic speckle pattern interferometry. Uh, it's what we used to call holographic non-destructive testing, but using uh, phase shifting techniques. And I'm going to, to show a particular system. I'll show a, a few measurements, but a real particular system that I'm going to show is something that was made to test the back plane of the James Webb Space Telescope. So um, the idea is a structure holding the, the mirrors for the James Webb Space Telescope is going to experience some mechanical loads, is going to experience some temperature variations. And the question is, how is this uh, back frame going to uh, deform? And the back frame, we'll see a picture of it in a minute, it's going to be pretty dark. And it's carbon fiber. It doesn't, I mean, it's a diffuse surface. And it doesn't even scatter very much, very much light. And so in order to do the measurements, we needed um, a pulse laser. And um, we're going to do the measurements where we can uh, do our four phase shifted frames in something like nine nanoseconds. And we can get down to 10 or so nanometers RMS, uh, a sensitivity, about 10 nanometers RMS on the change in the shape of the surface. So in this ESPI, electronic speckle pattern interferometry, as, I, as I've been saying, you know, we could have measured the individual phases and subtracted them. 
and that would then give us a deformation. And so, you, you know, we could have performed a phase measurement um, and then a, uh, deform the surface and do a second phase measurement and take the difference and see how the shape changes. But instead of that, we're, we're going to use this equation that we um, briefly looked at uh, at the beginning here of just working with the individual intensities. Because be truthful, I mean, we don't care what this phase variation is. What, if we're just reflecting laser light off of a diffuse surface, we're going to have a real speckle pattern, intensity variation, and kind of a, a random phase here. And so measuring that, you know, doesn't really, uh, it's not of much importance. And then measuring it after it's changed, well, again, it's kind of a random thing and not very important. So we simply are going to just work with the intensities here of measuring it initially, measuring these four phase shifted frames of data, deforming the surface some way, uh, measuring the four frames of data, and then by this equation that we had um, looked at before, we can determine how the phase distribution changed. And while this is random, you know, these are kind of random, the difference between the two is not going to be random. It's going to be, it's going to give us some information about the shape change. And so we take the arc tangent and we multiply it by lambda over two pi and we get the OPD variations. Okay. And so this, I mean, I'm showing this for a diffuse surface, but it would also, I mean, it would work for a specular surface as well, but it's maybe a little more mysterious, a little more exciting to see how it works for a diffuse surface. We could use lots of different interferometers for this, but the one that, uh, I don't know, every now and then it gets all messed up on my computer. Fortunately, it's okay on the, there. Now it's back nice on the computer. I mean, this is the approach that we looked at in the previous class of, um, um, this was for testing a mirror, and um, uh, we had orthogonal polarization in the two arms of the interferometer, and then we arranged it with a quarter wave plate so that test and reference beams have orthogonal polarization. And then we put this pixelated polarizer mask, wire grid polarizer mask, in front of our sensor. And uh, by looking at the A, B, C, D, so on, we're getting our four phase shifted frames. Now, I'm not going to be testing a mirror. I'm just going to be putting some object there. And we're going to measure out the four intensities, distributions. And then we're going to deform the surface. And we're going to measure the uh, four intensity arrays again. Now, if I'm looking at a diffuse surface here, the interferogram, I mean, it looks like this. It's just a... And if a speckles are too small, well, it's going to create trouble. And so <clears throat> we're going to some way reduce, or I should say increase the speckle size so the speckles are larger than these this unit cell, the four polarizers from which we obtain the phase um, variation. And so how do we make the speckle large? Those of you who have done this in the lab. I need a lot of coffee today. I was in Washington yesterday, and I didn't leave Washington until 7 o'clock last night. So. A little on the tired side. Of course, that was 7 o'clock Washington, D.C. time, so it was only 4 here, but I still got back kind of late. So if I'm in the lab and I want to make the speckles large, what? Ground glass. Well, I'm going to stop down the lens. If you just look at a speckle pattern, you kind of close your eyes, you'll see the speckles get larger. So these speckles are on the size of the something like the airy disk of the lens. And so my imaging system, if I want the speckles to be larger than this unit cell, I'm going to stop down the lens, the imaging lens here in the system. <coughs> That's another reason I used, I had to use a pulse laser. I mean, I needed 
I'm throwing away a lot of light when I stop down the lens to get the speckles large. And so I have to have to start out with a lot of light. Okay. So if you make the speckles too small, I mean you want you want all four of these detector elements to see the same to see the same speckle. The speckle size has to be at least as large as this unit cell. Okay, before we get to looking at the back plane for the James Webb Space Telescope, I'm going to first play around a little bit with smaller samples to see if I can um, make the system work. And the first experiment we're going to do is using this um, plate here. That's a carbon fiber, same, same type of material that the back plane is going to be made of. And what we're going to do is to measure, we're going to deform this surface here and see how this, and, and measure the deformations. Okay. So, I mean, this is a dark surface. It, it's very rough. If I had a copy, if I had it here, it would be very rough. Uh, and uh, it doesn't scatter a lot of light back towards you, but enough. And so my... My experimental setup for this is just, here's my interferometer. I just have a beam coming out here. And I think it was just a, um, a beam that was expanding enough to, to fill um, this entire area here. Or maybe I had a circular beam, I guess. I don't think I did the whole area, but we had a circular beam here. And um, then back here, we had a micrometer that we could turn that would push against this plate and deform it. And so if I look at the interference pattern for a single exposure, hmm, not very exciting, is it? You probably can't even see it. I can't even see it here, but on the computer, I can see there's some, there's some speckles in here. But it's not very exciting. What we're going to do now is that we're going to deform this, and we're going to go through this, um, you know, subtracting these intensities. So this will be my, my reference here, and so that will be the, the I1s. And now we're going to deform it and get new intensities, subtract the intensities, uh, do the arc tangent calculation, and, and calculate the height variations. And we're going to make a movie of that, and hopefully that will work here. Okay. So these are all measurements, and I don't, I can't read numbers here, but these are, I don't know, um, talking about nanometers to uh, to microns that we're going to measure as we deform it. And I mean, I I remember doing this, uh, and I was so excited because. It was, it was so easy, to tell you the truth. I'd done a lot of holographic interferometry, and you go through all this processing of the film and everything, and, and then you get the interferogram, you have to data reduce the interferogram. And here, it just and, uh, we did it. It was, it was really nice. So do you understand what we're doing and see what we're, what we're doing? Okay. Well, once you do this, you, you look at everything in sight and measure everything in sight. And there was a, a buzzer there that had a rough surface on it. And um, so we just uh, measured the, the shape changes as it um, uh, buzzed. And so that was kind of, I mean, it's, it's amazingly easy, actually. And then there always, you know, airflow. We have always have a can of compressed air in the lab. So you take the beam and you just blow the air into the, into the beam. Uh, you measure the index variations, optical path differences. Okay works uh, amazingly well. Okay, so now we're to the point where we're going to measure 
this uh, backplane for the James Webb Space Telescope. So you start off here with a, a pulse laser. I'll show a picture of, of the interferometer in a minute, but pulse laser. Um, some of the light's going to go out to this object. The object's going to be very large. It's going to be several meters away. And so the light here uh, is going to go out to the object. And not much is going to come back from the object. Just a little bit scattered back. And the reference beam is going to go out through here. And this laser had a fairly short coherence length. So we had to make the paths pretty much equal. And so, uh, and this object is going to be meters away. So we, we put in a fiber here and use that to delay the, the reference. And so the beam comes down here. So this is the reference. Down here to a mirror, back here, back here, and back there. And so again, you know, we got the paths approximately equal by using this fiber and then made it more nearly equal simply by moving this mirror back and forth. So the object is, you know, way over here, meters away, and some light scattered back here, and not much. And we didn't want to mess around with the light scattered back from these optics. And so we actually collect the light coming back down here. And so this is going to come in. So this will be a test beam. And this here was our, was our reference beam. Okay. And, you know, the two beams have orthogonal polarization. Uh, and then we, you know, put a little polarizer mask in front of our detector. And the interferometer, I mean, it's, the interferometer is mostly laser, is the truth of the matter here. And uh, light goes out to the object here and comes back. We collect it down here and finally gets to the detector down in here. So the first object we looked at was uh, not quite to the James Webb, but a carbon fiber target that was about a meter on the side. And it had little um, holes in it here. And it's about 6 meters, 6.4 meters away from the, the interferometer here. Okay. And so now we're going to uh, change the shape of this somewhat. So we make an initial recording of the four intensities, and then we'll change the shape. And what we see <coughs> is something like this. And it, I mean, this is changing a lot with time. And the problem, I mean, there's vibration present. I mean, we, we do a short exposure to get the baseline, and then we're doing these other measurements sometimes. And we get all four frames at once, but we're comparing that with four frames we got earlier. And so vibration is in there. But the real problem is air turbulence down here. I mean, this is changing like crazy because of air turbulence. But we can still work with the data. And we can, you know, we have these ambiguities that we've talked about. We, so we can, we can correct for those. We can go through and unwrap the phase. And we get something like this. But it's still, so we're doing a good measurement, but it's changing a lot with time just because of air turbulence. And so our way of fixing that is we just average a lot of data. And we average out the effects of air turbulence. And lo and behold, we can do a pretty good job of um, measuring uh, deformations. And so these are like, uh, what's that, about 1,500 nanometers. And can't read it too well, but minus 1,500. It's about 3,000 nanometers across here. And so we can average out the effects of terminals, and we can see how the surface is deforming. So now we're ready to go to the James Webb Space Telescope, or the back plane. We're not measuring the mirrors, we're measuring the back plane. And the back plane is mostly nothing there. I mean, this is the back plane here. It's just these little, again, it's carbon fiber. It doesn't scatter much light, dark, diffuse, and uh, not much material. But anyway, this is what's going to hold the, the various mirrors in place. And 
but we're able to get enough light reflected off of it, and we can do a measurement. And um, uh, so these are uh, is a particular measurement. We, well, not we, but NASA has done a lot of measurements on the back by changing the uh, the load and changing the temperature distribution and so on. So it works pretty well. So you know this is pretty insensitive, and air turbulence, which uh, drives you crazy, you get get rid of by averaging. It's random, and uh, uh, I mean sometimes you want to you want to make sure you don't have um, you want the, the air turbulence to be random. So sometimes you make the air turbulence worse by putting fans in the system to to uh, to blow the air around. And you can measure thermal mechanical deformations quite well. So, any any questions on that? So that's the way you do holographic non-destructive testing nowadays. What does that cost relative to the radio? What does that cost relative to the radio? It's very cheap compared to the cost of the telescope. I'll say it that way. <laughs> um, I don't know. The interferometer, uh, the the laser was was uh, rather expensive, uh, and I think that was provided by the government. But um, the rest of the interferometer, you know, it's it's a hundred to hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. And uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is well, the overrun on the James Webb Space Space telescope is billions and billions, so I don't. That's a pretty expensive system. Okay, so that's uh, one example that I wanted to show. The second one, which is going to use the same mathematics, is. <coughs> what we're going to call two wavelength or multi shifting uh, interferometry. So, I mean, what's the, the great advantage of interferometry is really the huge sensitivity that you have. You can measure down the nanometers or angstrom range. Uh, so that, I mean, that's a fantastic advantage. The biggest disadvantage of interferometry is the tremendous sensitivity. <laughs> you know, it, because of the short wavelength of the light, you have, um, if you do a single wavelength measurement, um, the sensitivity is very high, but because that the dynamic range is very limited, unless you play some tricks, which is what we're, we're going to do in this, in this section here. So if we think here, just what I put down here in the second paragraph here, is that in a single wavelength interference to well, Half difference of delta gives us the same measurement number as one that goes as an integer number of wavelengths plus delta. And so that can kind of drive us crazy. And so we're going to, going to see if we can solve that problem. And it's going to turn out that there are a few solutions to this problem. And um, in particular, we're going to talk about two different solutions. One is, if we think here, you know, you've, you've all, most of you anyway, have played with white light interferometry. And you know that you're going to, if you have a, a short coherence length source, you know you're going to get good contrast fringes only when the two paths of the interferometer are equal. And so, if we come up with an interferometer where the path length of the sample arm, say, of the interferometer varies, the distances or height variations across the sample can be determined by looking at either the, the mirror position, 
reference mirror position or the sample position by which the fringe contrast is a maximum. And we'll show some examples for that. And in this type of measurement, there really are no height ambiguities because the sample is going to be in focus when the maximum fringe contrast is, oh well, there's not going to be any ambiguities in the, in the height. And also, if we make the interferometer right, the sample will be in focus when the paths are matched and the fringe, and the, we get the maximum fringe contrast. So we're going to talk about this in a lot of detail in, in the next section. What we're going to talk about now is the second solution. And the second solution here is to perform the measurement at more than one wavelength and then compare the measurement results for the different wavelengths. And by, and I mean, this technique is old and you're going to see it dates back into the 1800s. But really by combining this two wavelength interferometry or multiple wavelengths, sometimes you use more than two, with phase shifting techniques, you can make a very powerful um, measurement system. So in talking about two wavelength interferometry, there's several different ways of thinking about it. And I'm going to mention three ways here. And none of these are new. They're all, they've all been around a long time. So the first technique, um, for lack of a better name for it, I'm going to call it calculated distances equal, whatever that means. So let's say that you know we're measuring some OPD here. And let phi, and sometimes with phi as a phase, but right now I'm going to let phi be the fractional fringe. So I'm going to say, well, the OPD we're measuring is some number of wavelengths, n, plus some fraction of a wavelength. Okay. Now, if I have no dispersion present, and I measure this using two different wavelengths, then I should get, you know, uh, should get the same measurement using two wavelengths. So I can write here that, you know, if, if I'm using a wavelength lambda 1, then I can say, well, this OPD here is equal to some number of uh, uh, wavelengths lambda 1 plus some fractional part of a wavelength times lambda 1. So this is the OPD. But at the second wavelength, then this is n plus, well, now this, the integer is different from n because the wavelength is different. So it's n plus delta, I write here, lambda 2, plus whatever fractional fringe I measure here, lambda 2. So just saying that Measurement at the two wavelengths should give me the same answer, so I set these two equal. I don't know what n is. Um, and um, so I, I'm going to solve for n here. So I'll just take this equation and solve for n. Now, but I know that n is an integer. And I know that delta is an integer. And I measure the phi, the phi's at the two different for the two different wavelengths. And so now what I do here is that I kind of play around with delta here. We find a delta such that n turns out to be an integer to within some tolerance. And so I find out what a delta is to get n an integer, and then I know what n is, and then I know what the OPD is. And if I had absolutely no um, or perfect, I mean, this is, this is a, a great way of determining the distance. So do you understand what, I'm, what I've done up to this point before we get to the problem down here? Okay. So this, you know, this technique has been around 100 years or more. The problem with this technique is, if I look here, phi is some fractional fringe measuring. And I'm thinking here that the fractional fringe, I'm multiplying that by the wavelength divided by the difference between the two wavelengths. So I'm actually multiplying that by a fairly large number. Same thing here for the phi at the second wavelength. And so small errors 
and the measurement of phi here are magnified by the ratio of lambda over delta lambda. Now, phase shifting is pretty good at measuring phi. So while I say this technique has been around for 100 plus years, um, it really became a lot better when phase shifting came around because we got a lot better at measuring um, phi. Before phase shifting, but the only time this would really work would be if we used multiple beam interference where we had very sharp fringes. And so we got improved in measurement of the phi. But once phase shifting came around, uh, that was a good way of measuring phi. But it's still, it's, well, it's kind of a simple method to understand. It's not really just because these errors are magnified by the lambda over delta lambda. But I want to make sure you, you understand this. Okay, any questions on it? If not, I'll drink some more coffee here. Well, the next technique, showing you the latest and greatest here, comes from 1895. So <laughs> this has been around a long time. And uh, I mean, Michelson, back in his day, I think he knew everything about it. He didn't have solid state detector rays and computers and stuff, so he, he couldn't do this phase shifting. But he really, he really understood interferometry very well. And this is a technique that um, he described, and it's called uh, exact fractions. So let's see how does this work. So a length is measured by <coughs> measuring the excess fractional fringes for two different wavelengths. So let's, let's say we know what a distance is to within a few wavelengths. And uh, so let's say we know that some particular length lies between 1,209 and 1,215 wavelengths of red light, particular, of a particular wavelength of red light. So we, we know it's in, in this range some way. And let's say we measure the fractional fringe, or what he calls the uh, excess fraction. And so <clears throat> we measure it to be 0.35 fringes. And so we know that this distance is 1209.35 or 1210.35 all the way up to 1214.35 um, wavelengths for red light. And from this information then, if I, if I change the wavelength to green, <coughs> I can calculate the number of wavelengths of green light it should be. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the calculated number of fractional fringes for green light with what I actually measure for green light. And then from that information, I can determine which one of these is the right answer. Okay. So I'll just repeat it again. We, we know that a length is within some number of wavelengths for red light. For my example, I said between 1209 and 1215 wavelengths. We measure the fractional fringe for red light, and we say, well, it's 0.35. And so we know the actual length is 1209.35, 1210.35, and so on. And from that, I can calculate the number of wavelengths or fractional fringes for green light. And I can measure the fractional fringe for green light. And then I'll know which one of these was the right answer. And then, you know, you, if you want to get even better to increase the accuracy, you, you, don't, you don't have to be limited to two wavelengths. You can do, you can do this for many different wavelengths. So this goes back to Michelson, and, and he did some great, great measurements back in the late 1800s, this uh, technique. 
<clears throat> the third technique, favorite here. And we're going to, again, you can use multiple wavelengths. I'm going to do two wavelengths here. And I'm going to say, well, the phase for, uh, the first wavelength, lambda 1, is just 2 pi times the OPD over lambda 1. The phase for the second wavelength would be 2 pi times the OPD over lambda 2. And again, I'm, I'm assuming the OPD is the same for both wavelengths. I'm assuming I have no dispersion. If you have dispersion, well, you have other problems. But I could write then the phase difference between what I would get using two wavelengths to do the measurement as just 2 pi, 1 over lambda 2 minus 1 over lambda 1 times OPD. And I could just rewrite this as 2 pi over lambda equivalent times the OPD, where from these two equations here, lambda equivalent is lambda 1, lambda 2 over the difference between lambda 1 and lambda 2. And I always like to put absolute here because I don't like having negative wavelengths. Okay. So we're going to measure something using two wavelengths. We're going to subtract the, the phases for the two wavelengths. And um, that's going to be equivalent to doing the measurement at a longer wavelength given by the products of the two wavelengths divided by the difference. Now, I don't know if this is really any different, not greatly different from what Michelson did, but um, early on in my career, I applied this to phase shifting, and I and that which kind of amazes me, but because um, I don't know that it's anything really new, but I was able to get a patent on it. The other way, of, and I, I should have I should have brought Moray here with me today, but I didn't do it. Is that you can think of? I'm getting a fringe pattern at one wavelength, getting a fringe pattern at a second wavelength, and I'm finding the difference between these two. So I could do the Moray between the two fringe patterns, and I end up with a beat fringe pattern, which is the same as if I had measured whatever it is I'm measuring using this longer equivalent wavelength. So of the three techniques, this is my favorite one. This is the one I've used a lot. And uh, I mean, it's, it's fairly common now. Um, any questions on it? So it's just, you know, this is kind of repeating what I, what I said before. We have this, we're taking the difference between the two measurements performed at two different wavelengths. And that's equivalent to doing a measurement at a much longer wavelength. And then the important thing is the bottom here. You know, if we're measuring something, we said that the phase difference between adjacent pixels has to be less than 180 degrees in order to get rid of these 2 pi ambiguities. Which means that the OPD has to be less than lambda over 2. Or if I'm measuring a surface, measuring a height at normal incidence, it says that between adjacent pixels, the height has to change by less than a quarter wave to not have ambigu ambiguities. But the great thing here is that it's not a quarter wave of the individual wavelengths, but rather it's a quarter of the equivalent wavelength. And so I can get a much larger dynamic range just by making the measurements, making the two wavelengths closer and closer together. And I, I mean, you can calculate what the equivalent wavelengths, the one that I remember, because I used to do a lot of this with a, using an argon laser. The two strongest lines from an argon eight laser was, were at 4880 angstroms and 5145 angstroms. And if you plug that into here, 4880 and 5145, you get an equivalent wavelength of 9.47 microns. <clears throat> 
Okay. So this is going to increase our dynamic range. Any questions at this point? I want to show some results here. And let me first maybe illustrate a little better just what the problem is. I'm measuring some surface here that has some height variations. And I get, if I use a single wavelength, I might get a fringe pattern that looks like this. And I look across here and I say, well, that fringe here must go with that fringe right there. You know, these fringes <coughs> must go together. But the truth of the matter is I'm measuring something with a profile that looks something like this. And if I were to look at this in white light, what I would see is, you know, here's a fringe pattern. And where the paths are matched, I get good contrast fringes. So that fringe there doesn't go with that fringe there, like I thought it did here, but it goes with some fringe way down here. And so if I'm just using, if I have large steps here, greater than a quarter of the wavelength of the light, I can get confused as to how large the steps are. And if, you know, one approach is to go to white light, where I can quite easily see how large a step is. And the other is to go to the equivalent wavelengths here, where here was measuring that grading, I guess. And with a single wavelength, I got something that looked like this, which was really kind of messed up. But by doing the two different wavelengths and subtracting the phases, uh, and getting an equivalent wavelength of 10 microns, I can really measure these steps. Okay. I see puzzled looks, but maybe you're thinking about last week's football game and wondering how we could lose by three points. I don't know. Okay. And I'll show this show some more measurements here. That's just fun. This was measuring another grading here. And this was an equivalent wavelength of 7 microns. So the, the difference between the two wavelengths um, gave us an equivalent wavelength of 7 microns. That works pretty well. So we have a peak to valley here, um, high to low of about 1.39 microns. And here's another one, just showing another measurement here. Um, And um, this had an equivalent wavelength of about nine and a half microns, I guess. And it shows a peak to valley of about one micron. So again, the, the step here uh, between adjacent pixels, the step has to be a less than a quarter of the equivalent wavelength. So if I look at this, I mean, it sort of looks nice, except I kind of look at it and say, you know, I got the step here nice. But maybe, you know, is that real, what I'm seeing here, or is that noise that I'm seeing here? And the problem is that that's going to turn out to be noise. Because we are, you know, we're, we're measuring these phases, we're, we're finding the difference between the phases, and now we're saying, well, a difference in the phase of uh, 360 degrees corresponds to this long wavelength, 10 microns or whatever it is we're using. And so we're really, again, a, a problem with this approach is that we are amplifying the noise. We're measuring things using short wavelengths, finding phase differences, and then multiplying these phase differences by this long wavelength. And so we're, we're magnifying the noise. And so we've gotten a good dynamic range here, but we don't have the precision that we had with a single wavelength. So is there any way to get around that problem? Of course there is, or I probably wouldn't mention it. But if we think here for a second, well, go back here. I mean, we're doing a very good job of getting what this step is, but we're getting a lot of noise here. So if I compare the heights that we measure 
with an equivalent wavelength with the heights that we measure at a single wavelength. I think, well, you know, this is good data here. This is good data here. It's just that I, I don't have the step right. And so what we do is we compare these two sets of measurements here. And whenever these differ by more than a quarter wave on the heights, half wave on OPD, quarter wave on the heights, we add or subtract some multiple of half waves to make them agree to within a quarter wave. And so the only thing we're going to use this equivalent wavelength for is, you know, we're going to find how this differs from a single wavelength. And then we know that the single wavelength is right, except these heights are off by um, some number of half waves. And so by going through this calculation here, oh my, I should have turned that off. Um, if your phone went off, I get mad at you. If my phone goes off, I get mad at me. Um, so we, you know, the, the only thing we're going to use uh, the second equivalent wavelength measurement for is to determine how large the steps are. And this approach then works very well for the, for the measurement of steps. It doesn't work so well in the measurement of rough surfaces. We'll look at another way of measuring real rough surfaces in a minute, but, but it works very well that measuring things that have steps in it. And so we can end up with the dynamic range of the equivalent wavelength, but the accuracy or precision of the, of the individual wavelengths. Don't you love this? Nah, not yet. But I've sold a lot of instruments using this technique, so I, I love it. Okay. Well, I mean, here we were talking about measuring a phase, measuring another phase, and subtracting the two, and ending up with what's equi what is the same as if I'd measured it with a much longer equivalent wavelength. And just like when we were looking at formations, you know, you don't, you don't really have to subtract phases. We're going to be able to work with the individual, individual uh, intensities, just like we did on deformations. And so you could go through here and subtract the phases and get what you'd have at the equivalent wavelength, or you can do just exactly the same thing that we did um, for deformations of working with the individual uh, irradiance measurements and, and uh, calculating the, the OPD for the equivalent wavelength using the individual intensity measurements. Exact same derivation we went through. And so I could use the same, you know, this, the same experimental setup we had before. Um, using the pixelated polarizer array, and that works very well with, with multiple wavelengths. And I'll just show one result of a system that we built using that. And this was, a, is, um, was actually built for phasing mirror segments. So you have a large mirror that's made of a bunch of segments, and when you put the segments together, you want to get the heights of adjacent segments to be equal. And the problem if you use a single wavelength is that you, could, you can be off by half waves. And so we're going to go to uh, equivalent wavelengths to, to get around that problem. And for the particular system we built, we actually had three lasers in the system. We had one at 660 nanometers, one at 637, and then we had one that were we a tunable laser that we could vary between 633 and 638. And in front of all these, we had uh, acoustic optic modulators, so we could we could select which wavelength we wanted. And um, I don't know, just so shows the interferometer. 
If you go through these, looking at these different wavelengths here, you'll see that you get equivalent wavelengths that range from 18 microns uh, to about 10 millimeters. And so if you're, you know, if you're, if you're phasing a mirror, you're probably going to first start off with a long equivalent wavelength and then keep working, you know, getting the mirrors closer together. And then finally, at the, at the end, you use just a single wavelength to do the final phasing. And I'll just show some results here. Um, this was for, a, um, for a, a small parabola, just a demonstration here of a parabola that had been cut in half here. And part of this was placed on a micrometer. It could be moved back and forth. And so these would be the fringes that we would get. And um, so we start off with the mirrors being a long ways from being phased. And then we, so we would use a long equivalent wavelength and then we'll finally work um, away towards the shorter, shorter wavelengths. And this is just um, doing measurements as we move the mirror back. And I think for this particular uh, system, we ended up with a mirror that's on the order of a hundredth of the equivalent wavelength. And uh, that was good enough to get us to where we could do the final phase using a single using a single wavelength. So you know we, we're saying interferometry is fantastic because of the high sensitivity and uh, we have several techniques for increasing the dynamic range by using two or more wavelengths and I think from my viewpoint the equivalent wavelength is a very good way of, of thinking about it. And while these systems, I don't think there's really anything new here that Michelson didn't know. Uh, it's really the systems of, well, these techniques have become much, much more useful in recent years because of being able to use modern electronics and computers and software and, and phase shifting. So any questions on that? So that's two wavelengths or multiple wavelengths. What I want to do now is to go on to white light interferometry. This is an area, I mean, it's really old, um, but again, by using modern components of computers and software and electronics and so on, we're really going to give it a, a, a lot of capability. And I'm going to call this vertical scanning or coherence probe technique. And it's all based upon the idea that what we've said many times is that if you have something with a short coherence link source, you're going to get good contrast fringes only when the two paths of the interferometer are matched. And so we're going to build some type of instrument where we're going to vary the path difference between the two arms of an interferometer. And um, uh, sense where the contrast is a maximum. And from that, we're going to end up with a measurement of a surface, surface shape. I don't, I, you know, I've seen white light fringes so many times. And this, I mean, this really looks, looks nice to me. And, Real life, of course, it looks better than it does on the, on the computer. But it's just, I don't know, something about white light fringes. I just, I just love them. You see the, all the wavelengths are in, uh, are in step in here, good contrast. And then the different wavelengths get out of step, and the contrast goes away. And, ah, I love it. OK, so white light interferometry. One nice thing is that uh, you can reduce the coherence noise. I keep talking about spurious interference fringes and speckles and stuff. And uh, by going to white light, we get, we get around some of these noise sources. Um, we're going to get around ambiguities in heights 
present with using single wavelength. And as I keep saying, the techniques are not new, but by using modern electronics and computers, uh, we can make them much, much more powerful. So, vertical scanning. So, <clears throat> A difference in phase. And as we said, the best fringe contrast will be when the zero optical path difference between the two. And you want to make sure you have dispersion in one arm, you want to have the same amount of dispersion in the other arm, because you want to make sure that the paths are matched for all the wavelengths at the same time. So you, dispersion can cause a lot of trouble if they're not. And we're going to build an instrument here where we're going to be, it's going to be a microscope system for what I'm going to show. So we're going to be looking at a surface and we're going to be clever in the way we make this so the surface is going to be in focus when the paths are matched. So this is also nice if I'm looking at microstructure, it's very important that I image on the surface and I want to make sure I determine the best image. And so with this instrument, the best image is going to be when the fringe contrast is the best. So that's nice. And so it might look like this. So the, the source here, um, well, it could be a tungsten halogen light source. Or nowadays, it, it might be a LEDs. Uh, uh, but you want to have a lot of wavelengths present here. Is, a, is the idea. And down here is a microscope objective. And we're going to have some type of interferometer here. And I'll show a better drawing of this in a minute. And I can't remember if I talked about these before. I may have talked about, did I talk about the Moreau before? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it here. But. And so we're going to be comparing the surface here with the reference. and. Um, Light's going to go up here to our detector. And then we're going to be able to translate this system up and down to very, well, the, the reference is going to be fixed, but the test, the length of the test arm is going to vary. So why don't I just go over to the Moreau itself here. And we talked about this before, but um, so the reference is coming up here. Sample is down here. We're going to keep this distance fixed, and we're going to scan the whole thing. And so we will both vary what portion of the sample is in focus, and we're going to vary the, the length of the, of the test arm here. And the other thing, that we, we say that we have to have the same dispersion in both arms of the, of the interferometer because we want the paths to be matched for all wavelengths at the same time. And so with this instrument here, the light's coming down here, going through glass there, down here and out. And the test beam is going through glass here, up here. So as long as this plate is made out the same material and the same thickness as this plate, then we will have the same amount of dispersion in both arms. And the paths will um, be matched at the same point for all the wavelengths. So that's that's important to have the same amount of glass here in both the reference and the test. So what we'll do here is that I have a sample here. And here's my interferometer. And that's the Moreau or whatever interference objective I have. And um, I'll first set this up. So I'm focusing on the top here. And so we're going to have good contrast fringes in the center. And as we move away from the center, the contrast is going to drop. If I come down here, I change this distance a little bit. Now I'm focused down here, again, where the red line is. But now the good contrast fringes are moving out because the paths are matched actually out here now as opposed to in the center. And then I have another position here, moving it down. And now the paths are matched out here. And so the good contrast fringes are out here. And I'll show one more here, moving it down more. So now the paths are matched way out here. So bad contrast in the center, good contrast out here. 
So as we go through this vertical scanning, we'll simply keep track of where the contrast is best. That's a function of what scan position gives us best contrast. That's a function of position across the sample. And so we're going to measure the shape of the surface by looking at that. Okay, understand basically how this works. So again, I, you know, this is nothing that Michelson didn't know, but he didn't have the great computing power of being able to go through this vertical slice and measure the contrast point by point and calculate where the maximum contrast is point by point as a function of scan position. So that's just, um, again, we're, you know, we're measuring a layer at a time as we do the scan, looking at the contrast over a layer at a time. So, you know, maybe it's a thousand by a thousand points. So we're measuring the contrast at a million points plane by plane as we move along. And so we're going to move, you know, nanometers between measurements. Uh, it has to be less than a, than a quarter wave, but we're going to move um, uh, eighth of a wave or something like that between measurements and measure the contrast as a function of position. And if I look at the coherence function, I'll get something that looks like this. So we do a vertical scan. And the goal here is to determine the peak. And so we're going to be measuring this at many points here, and then we'll, we'll fit a curve to it to determine where the peak is. And in practice, you can do this to a few nanometers, determine the, the proper peak to a few nanometers. Okay. And so if I look at, you know, let's say I have a surface that has three different layers here. If I put in tilt fringes, which I'll do just for illustration here, you know, you see you get maximum contrast here and then up here and then up there, showing that we have, you know, these are different heights. And so again, just um, this is looking at a, um, I think it was a micro-machine piece of silicon. One focus position gave us good contrast fringes here, bad in there. Another focus position gave us good contrast here and bad out here. Okay. And so now we're, we're measuring each point by itself as we go through this vertical scan. And so now, I mean, I can have steps much greater than a quarter of a wavelength between adjacent pixels. And since I'm, I'm, each pixel is you know, performing an independent measurement, um, I don't really have restriction anymore on the quarter wavelength step between pixels. And so I could measure something that, that looks like this, where this is a step of almost 50 microns and uh, I can measure it quite nicely here using this approach. And you, could, you can get measurements off about any surface. You have to be careful. Maybe sometimes the measurements aren't, aren't real true. If you have a real rough surface, the light goes down and you get multiple scattering and, you know, at the level of the surface and you, you might get some incorrect results, but I can get I, I can still get good, pretty good measurements uh, over most samples. This was a print roller. Um, what this has here in this region in the middle is some real little pits in it. And um, these pits hold ink as you're doing the, in the printing process. And as a print roller is used, uh, this wears down and you, you need to measure it every now and then to determine how deep the pits are. And this was a, a case where you could measure that quite nicely. And so these pits are, what, 27, 28 microns deep or so. And I'll just show one more yet today. Um, this is looking at a piece of paper. And uh, you can see the strands in the paper 
So this used to be fun. When, uh, uh, at WICO, we sold a lot of these um, microscopes of the sort. And you go to a trade show, and you'd ask a person for their business card, and then you'd, you'd measure the roughness of the business card. And, and they, they wouldn't think you could measure it, but you actually could do a pretty good job on it. So we'll come back. I'm going to stop here for today. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about this on, on Thursday. So you have homework due, and I think some of you handed in. I don't know if I have all of them or not. I have old ones I'm trying to get rid of here. And I want to remind you again that we have an exam two weeks from today. So I'll see you bright and early.